and I'd like to welcome you all to another Authors at Google talk. A little under six years ago, uh, about an hour and 20 minutes before this photo was taken, I was four blocks away, also looking up. Uh, moments before, I'd just heard a, the cartoon sound of an airplane flying into a skyscraper. It was a sound I was unable to process, just as it was impossible to grasp from the street the scale of what had just happened. Later, other images would fill in the mental gaps. Images like this one. And this photograph doesn't smell, but looking at it brings the smell back to me right now. Uh, it's not a frightening photograph, but seeing it recalls my fear on that day. Uh, still, now, six years later, looking at more than a handful of these photographs together evokes such a visceral response in me that I uh, have to choke back tears. So it takes uh, quite a lot of bravery to explore these photographs, the stories behind them, their meaning and their impact. Fortunately, there are a few people better qualified to do that than David Friend. As a correspondent, he's covered conflicts in Afghanistan, Lebanon, and elsewhere. He's been Life Magazine's director of photography and curated exhibitions of photography at the United Nations, the International Center of Photography, the Museum, and elsewhere. A winner of Emmy and Peabody Awards for his CBS documentary, 9-11, which has aired in more than 140 countries, uh, I'm delighted to welcome David Friend to Google to talk about his book, Watching the World Change, the stories behind the images of 9-11. David Friend. Thank you, Alexander. As you tell your... Uh, brief account of what, what you were experiencing that day. I'm finding as I go around the country speaking about the book, the book came out last year from Farrar Strauss, and then this week, or last week, came out from Picador in paperback, which you now have. Now have. Uh, I'm finding that people, wherever I go, when I tell them the subtitle of the book, talk about their own experiences. Every one of us connected in somehow to this historic event. It, it, I think it's true that our lives and our individual stories always connect. But in this particular case, it was particularly acute and particularly germane that we were part of a larger narrative. For the first time ever, history came to our shores in the form of a war where we were attacked uh, on US soil for the first time since World War II. And so each of us somehow was connected with this and feels connected with this and people can go on for 20 minutes and I, and I always sit and I listen because every story is riveting and you know now six years later. But each of us fe feels this connection and I think sort of a metaphysical or spiritual way this is true about so many of our stories and how our individual lives really matter. But this is particularly true that day. It's particularly true because we shared not only a historic event, but we shared a set of, of images that grounded us. We all saw the same pictures that day. And even though the accounts have changed and even though the internet has bred this sort of revisionist history of why it happened and what happened, the pictures for years will be there to tell us the sequence and dread of the day in this particular pattern, and and we have those pictures that we share in our collective unconscious. Um, it wasn't always this way, and, and you'll see in the book uh, a set of a sense of the history of photography, but a sense of the history of uh, of the digital transmission of photography just in that short period in the 1990s through now through now um, of how we came to see images so immediately in our lives. Um, 34 years ago, the question was, where were, you heard, where were you when you heard the news? And for some of the older, a few of the older people in this room, there aren't too many of us with gray hair, but a couple. Um, the, you know, the, the, that meant President Kennedy was shot in Dallas. Um, the equivalent, really, of when I was quite young, people said they were you know, I was listening on the radio or a teacher came into the classroom or, you know, we heard it on the intercom or someone had telephoned. The verb was heard. Where were you when you heard the news? Now, 
in the age of Google and the age of CNN and YouTube. YouTube didn't exist in 2001. Um, the question is, where were you that day? Where were you when you saw it? Um, people under, got, they got it on their pagers. They heard it online. They saw it online, or they got the information by a cell phone or on television. Um, in the case of the Kennedy assassination in November of 63, an intrepid reporter named Richard Stolle from Life magazine at the time went and procured for, I think it was n no money. I think it was a deal that was made, and I'm not sure exactly how much it ended, ended up being, but it ended up being donated to uh, the National Archive, I believe, procured the rights uh, for Life magazine of 22 seconds of film. It wasn't videotape at that time. It was a man named Abraham Zapruder who really had the first, was the first citizen journalist, if you will. He was standing at the parade route in Dallas and he took 22 seconds of film of the president being assassinated. It just so happened. Um, and for questions of taste, it did not run as a video or did not run as a, a film. It first ran three or four days later in still photographs in Life magazine. Now that was instantaneous in 1963. To see these images taken that no one really knew about and suddenly they're appearing in still format in the pages of magazine in three days was, was, was unheard of. And then we all watched on television at that stage when uh, four days after that, Jack Ruby, uh, the shot, the assassin, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. So, um, what happened in 2001, it's equivalent, we all saw the same event as it unfolded in real time. 2.5 billion people are estimated to have watched it that day on television or on the internet. That's a third of the human race the most witnessed event in the history of uh, mankind, most, hist most witnessed a news event in the history of mankind. And those of us who couldn't see it and didn't understand it or watched it on television would then go to the internet and look at it again. We had to see it until we could process it and understand it. It was that um, baffling. Um, so just to give an idea of how things have changed since from 2001 to 2007 in these six years. On 9-11, 80% of us chose TV as our primary news source in this country. Only 3% went to the internet. In 2001, Blackberries and Trios and uh, they were not really Wi-Fi. This was not a national addiction yet and uh, people didn't have access to in, in that way that they that they do that they do now, blogs were getting started, um, but there weren't really blogs with video files embedded in them, and there weren't uh, you know citizen journalism really came of age that day. Um, there were no cell phones that were camera capable, and my friend Elan Genistar, who was until recently the editor of Paris Match said to me one night recently that uh, were 9-11 to have occurred today, the attacks would be, have been, people would have had their cell phones in the towers and would have been able to photograph what was going on inside and then put, them, put those images over the internet. The internet lines were working, the telephone lines weren't working as well. So we would have witnessed what was going on inside as well. Uh, for better or for worse. Um, so what were we seeing? On, Septem and, and, uh, on September 11th, we were watching the same picture story. It was a cityscape that was under siege, a sort of pulled back image because it was very dangerous to go down there, though many journalists did, though many people brought their cameras out. Thousands of people brought their cameras out, camcorders, as well as still. It was really the fixed cameras, the stationary cameras, the, they call them the beauty cams that uh, are, are, are fixed that the television stations have, 
were how we tended to see this. We had talking heads on television or on the internet, and we had these this pullback image that felt, in effect, like a still photograph. Um, and we watched for 102 minutes. Um, and from the first strike to the instance of the second tower falling. Um, and this is exactly what Al-Qaeda, exactly what Osama bin Laden and uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, that, who conceived this idea, wanted to happen. Terrorism, by its very definition, demands to be seen and wants frightened eyes to see it and, and, and wishes that media fan the fury. You know, so that's sort of, that's what what was happening, and that's what Bin Laden understood. Um, he knew the whole world would be watching. So my book addresses, in very human terms, and sometimes in technological terms, what has happened. So just to give you a quick sense of the technology, and then I'll show you tell you a couple of stories, and I want to show you some images as well. How did this transformation occur? In, nine, in the 1990s, uh, there were two real breakthroughs. The first was the rapid transmission of digital pictures, digital news pictures, uh, this transition from traditional film to digital film, and then the ability through the internet to quickly transmit and post those pictures. Um, on 9-11, about... Uh, 100 and 1,200 frames were serviced by the Associated Press. That's seven times the number of news pictures that, in a typical breaking news event. And another friend of mine at Paris Match clo you know, said, you know, we closed our special edition on 9-11 in nine hours. And the, the lesson I would tell photographers is keep your Leicas in the closet. We need news immediately. We needed urgently to, to understand that day. And this transformation that had occurred in the 1990s uh, was, came into play just in time, 2001, for us to be able to see this. Second big breakthrough was satellite news gathering. Um, the Gulf War in 1991 uh, had proved that the whole world sort of needed instantaneous news. Um, I, I just a uh, quote in the book that says uh, that I, 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 I gathered from Time magazine that during the Gulf War, as the U.S. retaliated against Saddam Hussein for having invaded Kuwait, uh, Time magazine reported that the CIA director, that CIA director William Webster, received word via intelligence satellite that an Iraqi Scud missile had been launched toward Israel. He would tell National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft, turn on CNN to see where it lands. The network had become, in Time's words, quote, the common frame of reference for the world's power elite. End of that year, the man who was named Time's Man of the Year was not Saddam Hussein, was not George Herbert Walker Bush, <laughs> the men who had fought the war. The Time's Man, Times man of the Year that year, Person of the Year that year, was Ted Turner, the man who brought us the pictures of the war. He was deemed more important. And of course, he became co-chairman or vice chairman of Time itself, of Time Warner. Um, and this sort of, at that stage in 1991, was a precursor to what would happen. We would need to see news. We would need to see images. And we need to see it now. And we began this 24-7 news era that we now live in. Uh, because of fiber optic cables snaking under the ocean floors that were planted through the 1990s because of satellites that were circling 23,000 miles above the planet during this period. Uh, we, now, we became sort of connected in this matrix, and then there was a penetration into households of television sets and of, the, of uh, obviously, the Internet, um, which completed the cycle. So these two new technologies occurred, plus a few changes. And I'll just quickly read a section from the book uh, before I want to just get on, then get some, I'll show you some images. Um, 
The internet also played a key, key role here. On September 11th, the World Wide Web was a logical destination for those seeking urgent information, especially in New York, where phone lines were jammed and antenna-borne TV service was spotty. Quote, this is from uh, editor and publisher magazine. CNN.com saw 162 million page views on the day of the attacks, observed the Pointer Institute's Steve Outing, who noted that typical traffic was in the 14 million range. You see how much has changed. Stuart Allen, in the book Journalism After September 11, pointed out that, quote, between September 11th and 16, the online news category grew by 80% compared to the previous week in the U.S. Then you see people then shifting their news habits as the technology then changed after 2001 to going straight for the Internet. There's a great piece in the current Vanity Fair, which came out yesterday, which is on newsstands by Michael Wolf, who has set up this news site called Newser.com. And Michael really talks about the idea of the death of news, that really we don't need news. We get so much information coming from so many different areas now that it's almost this filter, this of, of uh, uh, this sort of, uh, I guess I've seen, seen the word in this week's Economist about Google, this cl the cloud. We have this cloud of news. And in, in this same sort of way, we don't need immediately to see to wait to get a newspaper, to get a talking head to tell us, we sort of have this, according to this piece by, by Michael, this ability to get the news in any, in news, news isn't news anymore. It's sort of an, uh, an amorphous um, entity. But what also happened that day in, in, in immediately in 2001 was um, this idea that, that, uh, that the internet was a primary hub for connecting different spokes of the 9-11 community. That first week, the web was an electronic philosopher's stone, an ultimately pliable medium for coordinating relief and emergency response, reaching out to the message boards or chat rooms, posting company emergency bulletins and obituaries, linking passenger manifest families to, to data from airline manifests, <coughs> raising relief funds and outlining terms of compensation among government agencies, corporations, and insurance companies. Second. Over time, the internet proved unmatched as a receptacle for posting and archiving stores of information, much of it vis visual. I go on in the book to talk about so many of the areas where people put visual information about 9-11. There's a show I urge people to see, which, which is reviewed in the New York Times today, but opens, I believe, next week, called Here is New York, up at the New York Histor Historical Society, the most comprehensive photo archive, 1,500 images I think will be there, but I think they have 8,000 images by average citizens from that day, and they'll be shown along with artifacts at the New York Historical Society. Um, but, all, but so many of these collections of pictures and collections of memorials, personal memorials, were put online so that people were able to um, go and with a, with a armed with a sort of few pictures and a web address and a prayer, able to remember their loved ones. Um, and mo many of these sites are still there. Second, uh, thirdly, there was a sense that blogs were conflated with real urgency that day and have, since rem and have remained so since. While blogs certainly exist before then, the idea of the, their importance that day was, was pivotal. And one of the first person who began blogging the next morning was a guy named Jeff Jarvis, who. In, who I'm sure a lot of you know of Jeff's work. He uh, is a teacher here at City University, but he's also um, his buzz machine is his his uh, his uh, website. He encouraged me to have a website, and I now have, you can go to watchingtheworldchange.com. And for those of you who came late and their books are gone, you can go there and just order a book as well. Um, I use this. I have my own book blog where I'm talking about. Uh, and, and posting, and talking about issues related to 9-11, issues related to photography, and readers also send me their pictures and send me their uh, recollections of the day. Um, and finally, uh, the web. Really, you had the birth uh, of citizen journalism. It had existed before then, but it really came of age on, on uh, you saw the really, the, uh, uh, according to uh, 
Dan Gilmore, who is a journalist who monitors sort of the grassroots importance of aspects of new and old media, said, that day, via emails, mailing lists, chat groups, personal web journals, all non-standard news sources, we received valuable context that the major American media couldn't or wouldn't provide. We were witnessing on the internet the future of news. Um, the book is not all about technology. It's about the stories of people. It's about <clears throat> people like Gene Coleman, who lives up in Connecticut, a realtor who saw a photograph of the 103rd floor of people hanging out the windows and saw both of her sons, so she believes, in the windows because they both worked at East Speed, a division of Cannon Fitzgerald. And through that picture, I tracked her down, and it took her three years to sort of come to terms with the photograph, and asked, she actually asked me to, if I could get her in touch with the photographer because she wanted to see if there were any off frames that maybe she could get more information about what affected her sons. The picture to her, I said, well, you know, why, why do you want that information? And she said, you know, it isn't, it wasn't obviously for her closure. It was a very horrific image to see the, and to, to get a sense of the scale of the death, but also the, the very personal uh, death of both of her sons. But she said, I, it was important to me to see it, to know that Scott and Keith did not just go into oblivion. By seeing them somehow, she had a sense of the, that they were entities, that this is what happened. In fact, this was, picture was taken 20 minutes before the tower collapsed. She's, you know, this was important to her because by the time I interviewed her, which was three years after the attacks, she'd only had gotten one rib from one of her sons. She had nothing else except this unspeakably uh, intense and hor horrific picture. It's also, my, the book also talks about so many other tales of people who use pictures to help them. Uh, there was a, a woman named Laura Greenstone who counseled people who'd lost loved ones. She's out in New Jersey and she was able, there was a mother who was continually, who'd lost her, a, a wife who'd lost her husband whose kids were very young at the time, and she was worried they wouldn't have a memory of their father. And she was would come to every session crying. Laura worked with her through art therapy, and she took, she had her, she, the woman, her life was uh, so disjointed that the, the patient actually, she came in and she said, what do I do with all these pictures? She had pictures in boxes that were mixed up. She said, so over the course of a year, the two of them together, ordered the pictures in sequence, got his life, the husband's life, and the children and the family's life together in an order. And then she had the patient go and select two shirts of her husband's shirts from the closet, had the kids pick their favorite shirt, and they, she bound two photo albums with the sh husband's shirt on the outside to have a tactile sense of his presence and was able, or after the course of a year, to feel happiness when she went to her sessions, to feel her, that there was a gathering together of a life. And so this sort of, this use of images for her really mattered. So in any case, the, the, every, we all have different connections to pictures and of that day, and the book sort of uses that as a way to tell the tale of a single week, the images we share. Let me show you, if I can get this to work properly, some pictures. Some of these are a little rough, so uh, uh, this first sequence, there's no sound on this, but uh, there we go. It was shot by Jules Naudet. Jules Naudet was shooting a documentary downtown on a firehouse. Happened to be there when there was a gas leak in the street looked up, heard this sound, they were all hearing this sound, and got the very first plane as it went into the North Tower. Jules was not the only person who shot this moment, and this became the beginning of a documentary we did together for CBS that Robert De Niro uh, narrated, which was called 9-11, and uh, it was really the story of a firehouse. 
um, and the book describes what these fellows did, but the, but the, the heroism of that day we all witness as well. But Jules wasn't the only one. There was also a Czech tourist, who, a, a Czech city, a New Yorker, whose brother was a tourist, and they were videotaping at that moment. And then there was a German artist who lives in New York named Wolfgang Stahl, who got the first plane going in as well. He had set up this crazy, wonderful internet art project. This picture has not been seen much at all because Wolfgang has not wanted to exploit it. It, uh, it, it appeared for the first time. Uh, one of the first appearances was in, the, in this book uh, and, in, and in a couple of art, art journals as well and, 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 one, and in France. But Wolfgang had set up this art project where pictures would be taken every four seconds from a window in Brooklyn and then transmitted over the internet to a gallery. And he started doing this on September 8th. And every four seconds, the picture would refresh, and it would be shown 22 feet by 9 feet as a mural on the side of this art gallery uh, on the west side. Um, I think it's like a block and a half from here. It's the Postmaster's Gallery, which I think is 20th, maybe it's 26th, so maybe it's, maybe it's a few blocks from here. Um, but people would go, and they'd see this sort of wonderful Zen-like New York, where a tree would move, and a, a boat would move, and a cloud would move, and the light would move. And it was sort of this sense that in real time, we, the world was a work of art. But suddenly, history trumped this vision. Because Wolfgang realized, and you can see from the digital printout and digital output in the corner, that the first plane is coming in, and then is uh, impacts four seconds later, and then impacts four seconds after that. So even before the event was an event, people were photographing it, which says a lot about our, the life, the world we live in now, of how everything is. Uh, I mean, when we can, on, we can go on Google, obviously, and see all of our homes. We are in a world where where the camera matters. Patricia McDonough happened to be there that day. She, she was in a, about five blocks away and remembered the morning in 1993 when she had been there and the first on the towers were attacked. And she woke up, heard this boom, said, God, this sounds weird. I, you know, she, she sort of had that deja vu from 1993 and, got, and then heard the sirens and got out of bed and she happened to have her camera, she's a professional photographer, happened to get her camera, and she happened to have a fisheye lens on it. And her Patricia's picture was just stunning to me when I saw it. You get the sense of an individual life and an individual world imploding, in effect, because of that lens. And then she decided not, she decided to look, she looked out her window, saw photographers going down there, photojournalists, saw the towers falling. She said, nobody needs another photographer. She was great at CPR and had been trained uh, in Red Cross um, uh, it, to, it, to help others. So she went out and walked down 14 flights of stairs and went into an ambulance and, and pitched in for a week. Many of us had to just photograph ourselves. You know, uh, this woman, Isabel Dazer, uh, who's an architect, had a you thought she was also an amateur pilot in her spare time, and so she thought someone just lost control of a small plane. So she wanted to photo. She, and a lot of us didn't know how to react. Didn't know what was happening. She wanted this a picture taken of her with her, you know, eight months pregnant at the time, and she ended up giving birth to a daughter. That she, a month later, she named Amelia after Amelia Earhart, one of her idols. And then there were all different levels of pictures at the time. This was taken the next day from space. There was, an, in fact, an astronaut, Amer the only American off the face of the planet that day, in the um, International Space Station who, photo who photographed the events from space as well. I write a lot about him in the book. But by the time the second plane attacked, it was almost like uh, elbow to elbow photo op. There were so many people who came down there, average citizens and others. Many people came down to help. 
many people fled, but, but photographers were sort of drawn to the event. Rob Howard was one of them who took it with this, this image. It just, it wasn't like he knew a plane was coming in. He, there would be no way to anticipate something moving that fast. He just happened to lean out and caught this image on a, on a medium format camera. As did Lyle Awurko, who did the same. He went in with a very, his camera was so high resolution that he was able to, uh, the, 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 the people examining the pyrotechnics and, and, and looking at how the buildings themselves were, uh, um, uh, ended up collapsing and looking at the structural damage, examined his pictures to, to get a sense of how the fires progressed. Evan Fairbanks was there, caught the same moment on videotape. He was doing a, 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 a teleconference with the Archbishop of Wales, who happened to be just down there at the, at the church, Trinity Church. This is the cover of the book. Patrick Whitty figured, you know, I want, I, I want he, he, uh, he had a flash moment. How do I shoot my own shock? He didn't want to focus on the buildings. He focused on the people, and he stood up on a curb so he could get a little bit of an angle at looking down on reactions. And just as he did, the second tower, the first tower fell, which was the south tower. Jerry Spagnoli, it just so happened, was doing, at the time, was doing a project using an old daguerreotype technology it was from the, you know, from the eight, from 1839. He was taking pictures of New York landmarks, so he brought to his roof a daguerreotype plate and an old view camera, and photographed what really, to uh, to him, gives a sense of of um, the picture. To him, shows that life goes on, not just that this is a horrible event. You look at the picture and you think. Civil War, or you think the fire, the uh, earthquake in 1906, or in San Francisco, you th it sort of compresses the precedence, as Jerry says, um, within the photograph, so that you get a sense that, yes, horrific things do happen, but we heal over time, and so you get this sense of the history within a single picture. On the total end, other end of the spectrum, John Ralt Labriola photographed Mike Kehoe, who was walking up the stairs. Uh, Mike, you know, you look at this picture and you think, there's a dead man. Um, what, you know, how is he going to his fate so wide eyed? You know, he's carrying 75 pounds of gear up the tower, north the, the North Tower. In fact, Mike got a Mayday order and ran down 22 flights and, and survived. He was saved by one minute with six others and, uh, and lived in, in, and became something of a, a hero because of this picture. Dave Brandolo, uh, the photographer, John Labriola, who took that picture, who happened to be working for the Port Authority, it was so taken with it. I mean, John photographed 120, I think, images as he walked down, as he went out in the street. Amazing pictures. He's just an amateur photographer who just really did that every day. He would take pictures of his surroundings. Just a wonderful photographer, wonderful man. And he went, he figured he'd seen so much, seen so many people falling from the buildings. He'd seen so much horror that he decided to go pray, and he went into Trinity Church. And at that moment, he went in and, did, and he met Dave Brandolo. Dave happened to rush down. He ran a printing plant. And so, and Dave has since become a professional photographer. But he caught the moment the, to the tower collapsed, first tower. So many people took pictures that day. Kelly Price photographed this reporter who happened to be for this re reporting for the street.com. He was doing Wall Street. He was really a, a columnist on, on Wall Street, uh, dealing about, you know, writing about uh, finance. But he became a war reporter, as did the photographer. Kelly was just walking and bought one of those little disposable uh, cameras from a bodega 
and fired off four frames before they both ran and both were saved from the engulfing clouds of dust. My friend Jules similarly survived the collapse of the first tower and then survived the collapse of the second tower and decided I'll just leave my camera on and started running. He felt a body jump on top of him as he ducked under this van. And as the tower was falling and all the dust and debris came down, he was saved by being under this van. But he felt this body breathing on him. And once the smoke cleared, he realized the person on top of him was the fire chief who was in that very first sequence you saw who jumped on him to save his life and saved his life twice, two times that day. And Jewel is now, Jewel and his brother Gideon, who French filmmakers, they're both American citizens now, are just terrific. They're doing a big show this uh, Christmas for CBS on, they've gone out and interviewed the 15 top leaders of all the religions in the world. The top 15 religions, I mean, they're just fascinating guys and, and CBS is gonna air that as a special Christmas week. Someone who was not as, there were two people who perished that day for two photographers and six people working for in television who were on the, the hundreds, in the hundreds, 110th and 104th floors, I believe it was, of the World Trade Center. Two of them were photographers who perished. One was Bill Biggert. Uh, here's his equipment. He, uh, his widow I interviewed for the book talks a lot about Bill's experiences and and uh, the fact that he um, he self-assigned, he just sort of heard that the attacks were happening, he heard the buildings were under attack, and he just went down there, as so many photographers did. Alex Webb was on his rooftop and just did this picture. I asked Alex about this, and he said, look, um, you look at this picture and you think, well, life goes on, which is something Jerry Spaniola, you said, but it's also the sense of what sort of world are we bringing our kids into? This picture had a lot of controversy. This is a picture taken by Thomas Hopker and wasn't published for four years. The first time it appeared in America was in the book and on my website. And Frank Rich wrote a couple of columns about it and there was some back and forth. Um, the notion when you look at this is you feel possibly that, they're that these Five people are somehow relating to this and just they've moved on, which is what the thesis of Frank's column was. They took exception to that and wrote columns for, I believe, Salon or Slate, the two people on the right, saying, how could you presume or the photographer presume to know what I was feeling? They were very upset and were talking about the experience. And the woman who's leaning back and whose body language conveys possibly something lax wasn't anything but. she. Her grandmother helped the architect build the World Trade Center, so uh, or was involved in the plans for the building. So we bring, like as we do with music, we bring our own association to pictures. And so Thomas, when he shot this fake picture, when he looked at it on a light table, decided not to run it, not to not to publish it. He just felt it was the wrong message to send. Possibly it meant. When we looked at it, there was too much complacency. It wasn't the sort of, it wasn't a proper 9-11 picture. Obviously, over the passage of time, he changed his mind, and I'm glad he, he did, because it's a very chilling, telling picture. I'll go through this really quickly, and we can, yes, we can talk a bit. Um, just a sense of how many different ways pictures affected us that week. We tracked the the hijackers through their images on cameras, um, on at the, air, the airports, their visa application pictures, the Bush administration, President Bush, as any any Democratic or Republican president would have done, went there and was photographed there, and Luke Sant, the 
photo critic says, you know, it's understandable that he went there. We wanted to see our representative, the president of the United States, walking around on something down there, you know, sol solidarity. Unfortunately, the Bush administration then misused this picture, in my estimation, um, and used it in campaigns for four years, three years later, during the 2004 election, where this picture was uh, was quite often used for the election campaign and was used at the convention, which of course was held in New York, 15 subway stops north of the attacks. Bin Laden did the same. Bin Laden doesn't exist as a public figure. He exists only as his picture or his audio tape. We know in every so often he's releasing these this propaganda as he did at that at that point. Very sophisticated and we use that image ourselves as a culture. This was very early on. TomPayne.com produced this. I remember seeing in the New York Times, I want you to invade Iraq. And it was just the exact thing that, that anti-war activists early on in 2002 and, th two and three were saying. And then images, because this picture by Stan Honda on the cover of Fortune um, sort of represented the collapse of the financial services industry at that point. And then this picture, which I devote a whole chapter to, Thomas Franklin's picture of uh, heroism, but also the backstory behind this picture. Um, so I would love to um, entertain any questions or people's reactions or people's you know own connection with the day. Um, if there's any anything you'd like to, to ask, or uh, and I also encourage people to go on watchingtheworldchange.com as well. I wrote a, I put a little thing up this morning about Google, so about uh, about my uh, about certain things because Google is really involved with photography lately. Yes, thank you, David. Um, you said quite a bit. Uh, earlier, that you think people need to see news images, need to see, need to be part of the cloud of information. I know that I, I went home and I was drunk for four days. I didn't watch the TV. Uh, I was oblivious, and I'm glad I was. Do you think we really need that? Well, I think for two reasons we need it. One is that people had to know it was such an urgent time. There were so many people who lost friends who wanted, they needed information to process their own mixed emotions. So some people, obviously, as you did, wanted to forget in that short period. But in the more, so for, for um, there were immediate needs for information on so many different levels. But in the longer term, we have to remember, uh, of all people who, who I do, you know, I do really politically have some issues with Rudy Giuliani. But Rudy Giuliani created a wonderful, was involved in a wonderful documentary called In Memoriam, in which he says, you know, we really need to forget, we, do, we really need to know exactly how bad it was. Because if we don't, we just lose sight of, you know, if, we, if everything is just flags and, um, and heroes, we forget how we, we, we become complacent. And so a lot of the pictures represent that. And I know they're very tough to see, but I think we sugarcoat too much in our society now, and need to need to know the real truths. So if we'd see, if we if if we had if we had seen coffins coming back from Iraq, I think we might have of soldiers from Iraq. I think we might have gotten to the stage we're at now in 2007, maybe in 2004, or 2005, and maybe saved that many lives and that many. Iraqi lives. So I think we can't always soft pedal and think about questions of taste. I think we, we do that too often, and that's, I think, what, what photojournalism is meant to do, is to shake us up and to document and chronicle. Any other questions? Uh, the, uh, the, the one picture that uh, 
was wasn't published until recently of the the folks um, sitting around with the bikes uh, talking about the the towers. I'm I'm wondering what other examples of of self-editing similar to that that you might have run across in putting the book together? Well, it's interesting. Uh, self-editing, a lot of photographers don't. They, they shoot, they give it to editors, and the editors edit. They, they don't want people to see things. A friend of mine, who, who Marianne Golan, who's the, uh, de- who's the director of photography of Time magazine, said, you know, there really weren't that many horrific pictures because the devastation was so total that people were, you know, it wasn't like you had a whole front of a telephone, the keypad. You just had a little piece of it, you know. So there weren't body parts that often. There wasn't all that much immediately to see, and it was very difficult to get to those areas. Uh, People were kept out immediately by... Um, for their own safety, uh, right in the vicinity of the towers by uh, police down there and military folks that came quickly down there. So there wasn't necessarily that much that wasn't seen those first couple days that w- that was censored, if you will. And she, w- she told me that she went to Europe once and she had, uh, you know, people were angry. Like, of course, you guys censored it. You didn't show all this. But they, Time magazine did not. And I know the New York Times did not. They were showing pictures of people plummeting. But I know a lot of the networks did not. And, I, and, and possibly rightly so, that uh, the core horror was so terrifying that we didn't, on top of it, need to see people falling from the towers. Whereas in Europe, this went on repeatedly, over and over and over. We not only saw the planes going in, but, but they saw that, but they saw a lot, you know, people falling from the towers as well. And that was, um, if there's a sense of censorship, that's something that certain networks ran once and not again, or not at all. There was decisions made not to um, gratuitously show yet another aspect of it. Maybe wrongly so. Maybe that's something that should have been, you know, you can, you have a, you can argue on both sides. But beyond that, I don't, I, I don't know of other images that immediately come to mind that, you know, I know a lot of photographers who just still haven't shown their pictures. They say, David, I'll show them to you at some point. But people just stashed it away. They saw so much through that, their lenses. They just still can't come to grips with it or face the fact that they did or want to e- exploit it, if you will. Well, thank you for coming today, and I, re- I really appreciate uh, your your interest and 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 if you have any recollections yourself or any reactions, I encourage you just to write me at the or email me at the website, and I'll be happy to post them, and I'll be happy to sign books afterwards if you like as well. Thank you. <laughs>